But thanks so much for listening. If you're listening to us for the first time, please subscribe so this gets out to more people. If you're listening to us on the radio, obviously you can't subscribe, but we thank you for listening. We have Victoria Wick, and she has an amazing story that she's about to tell. She does have a book out, which you'll see. I'm, you can see actually right now in back of her. We'll talk about that. She's been on HSN, and she has a powerful story about coming to America. So, Victoria, thanks so much for coming on. I greatly appreciate it, and we look forward to this conversation today. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. and. Um... Yeah, thank you. All right, so let's talk about, can you tell the viewers a little bit about your story in general? Yeah, so um, I won't bore you with all the details, but I came here, uh, my parents brought me here uh, when I was 13 years old. I was oldest of the five kids. And um, back, you know, back when I was a little girl back in South Korea, um, women, mothers would prefer boys because it's part of their tradition that the boys carry the, you know, the name of the family and all that stuff. Um, so uh, my, since my parents had four girls and the girls were supposed to grow up looking for the Mr. Right, you know, like you're not supposed to go to college. Uh, you're not supposed to work outside of the home. There's all these social cultural barriers. So my parents just decided that, you know, they wanted their, their girls to have more options than, um, just grow up to procreate. Now, my father would always say that if, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a stay-at-home mom or, you know, uh, simply having those as, as your dreams. And if, if so, let that be her choice, not, mm. you know, limited by society's choice. So we came here and uh, I guess the day after we arrived here, uh, we realized that the Korean government had frozen all of our assets. You're not supposed to leave oh, wow. uh, the country without, you know, this was years back when a dictator was actually running the country. So $30, seven people. Um, so, you know, our lives were uh, turned around pretty quickly. So we had, you know, almost everything. I mean, we weren't super rich or anything, but we had food and, you know, we had a driver and all that. Um, so we came here and uh, didn't speak English. Uh, we had no friends because we thought we were going to rely on some money that we had. Mm -hmm. um, and so I grew up from that setting, from that background to uh, building my own little business with, you know, a jewelry business that kind of, you know, really thrived. And I ended up on HSN uh, in 1998. I had about a 20 year run there. Then I went left there after two 10 year contracts were over. And then I wrote two books. One is a fiction and one is a self-help book and um, both to be released in 2023. And then I'm here with you. <laughs> So we'll get into stuff, and I know we don't have much time, so maybe we'll try to get more into more stuff on another note, but on another day rather. But I do want to get into some stuff you've been involved in. So let's talk about this. I do want to talk about the jewelry business. What got you into jewelry in general? Yeah, so that's really interesting because when I first came to, so my, it's very common in Asian families, like mm -hmm. especially noble families, um, even if you're not a, a high ranking noble, but you consider yourself noble, um, that you have this family legacy. So they kind of record um, who's, you know, married who, who's died. So there's a family registry and you can actually go to the city hall and pull it. So my family traditions go back to the first person in my tree of my father's like generations back was year 1310. So 1310 and up to now, uh, I have jewelry. The only thing through, through all the wars and everything, the only thing they were, the women were able to take was little box of jewelry. Mm -hmm. And they weren't really expensive jewelry. I mean, people used to get married like a little jade ring, you know, uh, but it told the family history who had what and what milestones were, you know, uh, uh, celebrated in which way. And um, when I came to America, I noticed that most of the jewelry was sold on um, status, uh, snob appeal. You know, it's like, I got this uh, two carat diamond from Tiffany's, doesn't my husband love me kind of thing. So, you know, it wasn't like, and, and by the way, Rob, if you are a decent, nice, you know, great guy who, and you're marrying a wonderful earthy girl who didn't care about diamonds, but, you know, you propose with the quarter carat diamond, you're almost like a social misfit. I mean, you're not even, you know, considered a human. Um, 
and, you know, I just used to think that was really odd. I mean, remember, I'm coming from another country where um, most people in Korea used to get married with just a simple gold band, or sometimes not even a gold band. It could just be like a, anything that just symbolized you were married, okay? Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, in fact, men didn't even get a ring. Do you know that there is like a, a billion people in China that are married that never got a ring, like men oh, actually wow. that never got a ring because it was not a part of the tradition. So I used to think this is really odd. Um, there was no like taste level or style. All the rings look the same. In fact, Tiffany's has sold the same four prong Tiffany setting for literally 125 years. Wow. So I thought, you know, you know what, like, what's wrong with just uh, jewelry that's beautiful, that doesn't have to cost a fortune, that you just love having it, like little butterflies or, you know, little something, little leaf. Um, so I started creating that because uh, coming from my background, I used to think that, you know, when we first came here, my parents, I just told you the story about how we didn't have any money. Right. So my mom and my dad both went to work at six o'clock in the morning, the very next day. I mean, my dad started pumping gas. Uh, off air, I just told you he was a doctor back home. So basically um, started pumping gas. My mom worked in a sewing factory. Like they didn't get home till it was dark and they always left before so the sun rose. So, you know, I didn't, I really craved having my parents around me because I, I knew what it was like before I moved here. Then when, it, when I moved here, I didn't have any parents. Like they were gone all the time. So mm -hmm. when I grew up, I thought, you know, uh, everything looked so hopeless, Rob, like my life, like we didn't have any money, didn't speak English, had no friends and no help. I used to think I was never going to make any money. This whole American dream is a total joke. You know, it, it's, it's going to be made a dream. It will, it will never, it's never going to come to reality. Mm -hmm. So as long as I was never going to make any money, I might as well at least do something that I can take care of my children. I can be there for them. That's the greatest gift I have for them and do something I love. Um, to do. So at least that way I could say I enjoyed it right later on. So I, it, I was always a creative person. I loved like sparkly little things. So I, you know, I designed this jewelry, hoping that there's a market for that, hoping that all of America isn't all brainwashed with this uh, status symbol, right? So I created jewelry that was anything but that, anything but like the, the status symbol, you know, beautiful things that didn't have to cost a whole lot of for, you know, money. So that's how I started my jewelry business. And I was right. Like women just loved, you know, having uh, affordable options that expressed their feelings. So that's how I started my jewelry. So how did the move go from, you know, starting the small jewelry business and then going on to HSN, which is seen all around the country? Yeah. So what happened was, um, you know, I had a goal, which was, I wanted to make $2,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And I saw this girl um, at, in high school that like she was going to, you know, remember I lived in the ghetto. So like this girl had like a 10 year old Camaro, her father had bought her a Camaro and she was driving it off. And I thought, wow, like I want a car like that. I wanted to, you know, I wanted a, <laughs> like a faded old Camaro. If I could afford that, that would be my American dream. Um, and I also wanted to be able to pay my rent. So my goal was to make $2,000 a month so I could you know, feed my kids. And, but I also wanted to make sure that I didn't work more than 20 hours a week. Okay. So that was my goal. And then when I started my company, remember I had no money. So like, I didn't have any money to make a sample or anything like that. So I just drew them out. Now, going back a little bit, when I first came to America, I didn't speak any English. So I'd have to literally draw out like a toilet to go to the bathroom to my teachers. We didn't have English as second language and there were no Korean kids in high school. So um, I would draw things out like, you know, that almost like a Pictionary. That's how I communicated with my teachers. So later on, when I was uh, designing jewelry, I was already very artistically inclined when I in back, back home. I wanted to be like a Van Gogh artist. Um, so when I, so those skills just kind of got really honed in. And, um, so, you know, I drew out my, the, what I thought might sell in 3d. So I would have the top view, the side view mm -hmm. and the profile view. And I had a nice little portfolio and I went down to all the like department stores nearby me and asked like the department assistant manager of the department jewelry department, like, you know, look, I'm just, um, I'm brand new. I, I, you know, I've never been in this business before. I've, in fact, I've never been in any business before, but I have dreams of working in this industry. 
And I'm just wondering, like, since you guys see like all the customers, you know, do you, um, could you just like look at it and see if there's anything that you might actually, you know, that your customers might be interested in? I'm just, I'm not really embarrassed if we show it to you, but like, just pick one, anything that I can work with. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened was the first store I went to was the Neiman Marcus on uh, Wilshire and Rodeo. That's where all the movie stars shop right. to this day. And the manager was like, oh my God, these are beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Like we can sell all of these, like, you know, like right now. Wow. And because like our customers don't want anything in the case. And she said like, everything is so boring. It's the same thing. Like you just, they just get come here, but bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger rock. Like they, there's no, no style to it. Yeah. So then, um, so, you know, basically I was able to get a, almost like a focus group. I mean, I wasn't that sophisticated to actually even realize that that was a focus group, but it was like a mini focus group. So then I thought, well, this like, okay, so everybody I knew, everybody I knew would think twice, three times for days to spend 50 bucks on anything. Mm -hmm. So these people are wanting to spend, you know, five, 10, $15,000 on something like sight unseen. These, this is ridiculous. They can't be like, this can't be real. So then I kept going to other stores, <laughs> you know, I went to the Macy's, I went to all the different stores. And I ended up with a few that I thought I could sell, that there was a market for it. So but what happened was um, working 20 hours a week didn't seem like that was uh, doable, meaning that, you know, if I call somebody at nine o'clock in the morning and somebody calls me back at four and I'm working nine to, you know, 11, I mean, obviously I'm going to take that phone call at four. So that means I'm still working. So I thought, well, coming from Korea and I used to have to call my aunt sometimes. And, and you know, we, we, it was like a real treat sometimes like once a month, we would like, we, my father would look at the cheapest rate uh, for the week or something. And it would be up at two o'clock in the morning or something and call my aunt. So I knew that there were different time zones um, that existed around the world. So in California, for example, uh, 6 AM California time is about 11 to two uh, in Europe, depending on where you're like, it's like 50 countries around, uh, around London. So basically I started faxing these people uh, abroad because that's the only time I had because my kids would, uh, I'd have to drop my kids off at about 8.30 in the morning. Um, so I worked from, you know, 6 to 8.15ish. And then when I dropped them off, came back, I started like about 9.30, I started working the East Coast time zones. Uh, like, you know, most of our jewelry uh, buyers like Saks, um, Saks Fifth Avenue, Bloomingdale's, they're all East Coast. So right. I worked those time zones. And then I didn't work from... Um, two o'clock until about eight 30, two o'clock is when I picked up my kids. And then until about nine o'clock at night, you know, until they went to bed, I was a full-time mom. Um, mm -hmm. 9 PM um, is uh, about 11 o'clock in the morning in Asia. So then I opened up all the Asia stores. So I had a global wow. business basically. So what happened was HSN called me um, about 1994 and asked me like, you know, your stuff is like so beautiful. It's at, you know, Neiman Marcus, it's everywhere. Like, you know, we want to have you here. Mm -hmm. So I ended up uh, on HSN in 1998. I, I, I didn't even know who they were when they actually called me, oh. you know, because, of, because the TV, TV business wasn't like really, yeah. I mean, we used to call like Spiegel catalogs and they used to have mail order catalogs. Um, and the idea that somebody's going to buy something on TV, like jewelry on TV, just didn't like, uh, uh, what kind of people do that? I used to think, you know, <laughs> like, you know, people like really stupid or, you know, I used to think like that was just weird. And I was, my stuff was, you know, by that point, I was selling um, all 35 different airlines. I was selling all the cruise uh, ships, department store, major department stores all around the world, including the ones here. Like I sold Neiman's and Saks and all those stores. And when HSN called me, I was like, you know, like, I, I don't know that I want to be on that. Like, you know, you guys are like grandma shopping network and that's like a nightmare to me. You know, I didn't want to be on it. <laughs> so... As you know, I'm like very honest. I just don't know, like, I don't, right. don't want me on that thing. Um, so it took me a few years for, for me to, you know, get my head wrapped around. And, and they had grown quite a bit in, in that time. So, you know, that's how I ended up at HSN. But, you know, I had a 20 year run. I left there in 2017 after a very successful career there. But let's kick around the book again, Million Dollar Passion. What is it about? What do you hope people learn from it? 
Yeah. So um, what happened was, you know, I, after I left HSN, I always dreamt of uh, writing books. Uh, I'm an mm-hmm. avid, avid reader. I love to read. I, I read about 30 to 40 books a year, every year. Wow. And um, so I wrote my first book, which is a fiction. And uh, I loved mm-hmm. the book. And, you know, I started presenting it at the writers' conferences and all that. And then all these people started, like, recognizing me. Like, people in the, a lot of females in the publishing industry. Hmm. I, for example, I, you know, I pitched uh, HarperCollins, um, Random House, all the, you know, I got in front of all of these people. And when I pitched them, they're like, well, wait a minute, do I, do I know you from somewhere? And I'm like, I don't think so. I've never written a book before. <laughs> and I know my book sucks, but you probably haven't seen it yet. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I just told people like, no, but they were like, you know what? I, uh, and then, you know, they realized that they've seen me on TV for all these years, you know, right. like they, they were avid customers of mine. They just didn't put the two into together, like the jewelry designer and the writer. And, uh, and of course, when you're on TV, you got to make up artists that hairdresser, like, you know, fluffing your hair, like every 10 minutes when you're on the set. So I probably looked substantially better when I was on TV, but, um, they said like, why don't you write a self-help book? And I said, well, okay, why would I, what would I help people with? Um, so, you know, I didn't really think that I could help other people, um, because I feel like as, you know, astonishing as my journey was starting from nothing to actually, you know, overachieving my American dream, which was to buy my Camaro. By the way, I never bought the Camaro because, you know, I, 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 my first car was a Pinto, which was substantially less than that, but (laughs) I ended up getting, you know, better cars later on. But, um, I thought, you know, if I can, looking back at my life and I, during COVID, um, I started feeling really guilty because my I'm, I'm on Shop HQ now and the online businesses were on fire during COVID. As you know, like all the, you know, Amazons of the world, like, you know, we did very well. TV stations did very well. And, um, and I, th- I felt really guilty that there were people suffering. People didn't have jobs, restaurants being shut down, you know, people were getting sick. And I was still like, just my life was actually better financially and so I started giving a lot of um, advice and going on a lot of podcasts um, and trying to just help people. And I did, a, you know, completely free of charge. And then I realized, you know what, I can help people because, you know, after we went through what we went through as a country, as, as a human race, um, if you, if it's not apparent today that if you don't turn your, turn your passion, if you don't have passion for something, you know, everything else is hollow. You know, when you have passion and purpose in life and you turn that into, you know, maybe you can monetize that, then it means something. It's rewarding and it doesn't feel like it's such hard work because you're at least enjoying it. So, you know, I just thought I can turn people's passion, you know, I can, whatever, your passion could be, you know, lifting weights in the gym. Your passion could be jogging. Your passion could be feeding, you know, chickens in a farm, like whatever it is that you do, I can teach you how to monetize that. Because I've done it. I mean, as you mm-hmm. like, if you read my bio, uh, my yeah. total sales on HSN was over five hundred million dollars. Um, I can help you monetize that with no outside help by yourself. Because when you're passionate about something, uh, and there is a, you have fires all around you every day. You know, crap happens to you know to you all the time, and that's part sure. of life. But if your fire inside, it burns brighter than what's on the outside, then you can overcome anything. And, um, so I wanted to create that. So I wrote the book called, um, million dollar passion and it, unlike most other books, it is written by somebody who actually turned her, you know, unthinkable. I mean, the other thing too, is jewelry business is a tough business. I mean, if you travel, you can go to Africa, Dubai, um, you can go anywhere in the world. I mean, seriously, China, anywhere in the world, you'll be, you'll have a Chinese restaurant and you'll have some sort of a jewelry store. It is that competitive. <laughs> so if you can start, if, you know, if anybody can come in here and start a business, the size that I built with nothing, no, you know, no help, nothing. You, all of you sitting at home today who are equipped better. I mean, when I started my business, I had to pay for things like a fax machine with the pay, computers were, you know, like $5,000 a per, you know, a piece. Um, right. Today, you know, like also like focus groups, um, doing research, all this stuff is free on the internet. You could actually put up a post on Facebook today and do your little focus group all day long. Um, we didn't have that. We had to pay for all that, you know, back then. So I feel like, you know, anybody who's got passion, 
I don't care what that passion is. Let it ring, you know, you know, let it out of the genie box. Don't, if you are not building your own business, if you're not building your own dream business today the, and you're working for somebody else, the chances are you're spending your life building somebody else's dream. Yeah. All right, Victoria, thanks so much for your time. If you could just tell the people where they can find more about you, the website, the podcast, and obviously when the book comes out, where they can get that. Yeah, so the podcast is Million Dollar Passion Podcast, and it's above available on all uh, podcast platforms, you know, Apple, Spotify, Google. Um, and then you can also come to milliondollarpassion.com for all the freebies. I have free eBooks. You can sign up for my books and I'm going to give away like a hundred of them for free when they, when wow. they do come out. And then you can also, if you're a jewelry fan, you can go to victoriawick.com and you will see, uh, you know, uh, where you can find my jewelry. I've got like uh, patented uh, uh, Apple iWatch cases as well, all those things you can get um, on victoriawick.com and my when my shows are on Shop HQ because I'm on there once a month still. Victoriawick.com, definitely check it out and definitely check out the podcast, uh, Million Dollar Podcast. Victoria, thanks so much.